Ever since the dawn of time, Kerbals have dreamed of landing on the moon. Or at least since version point twelve came out. Hey everyone, this is Tridang to Live here with another tutorial. This one I have been looking forward to a long time. We are going to the moon. We are going to land on the moon. We are going to return home and you are going to learn how to do the same. Quick note, this video was made in version point twelve in future versions of this game. The information may change. I'll post annotations to note any changes. When moon landing was first possible, I posted a video on how to do so, but I wasn't satisfied. I wanted a way to get to the moon, land, and return, but even that was enough. I wanted a way to land that was easy and safe and in my style completely with stock parts. So let's get started. First, we will build our lander craft. This craft needs to be strong enough to land on the moon while light enough not to hamper our ship on the way up. So we start with our capsule and a parachute, add a decoupler. We follow that with an advanced SAS, a fuel tank, and a vectoring rocket engine. After significant research, I found out that winglets make for the best landing gear. They're light, won't bend, won't fall off, and if you hit them hard enough to actually break them, you'll destroy your whole rocket in the process. We want them to be able to detach for our return trip home, so we'll add them to a set of radial decouplers. We'll use the three symmetry tool and place radial decouplers as low as possible. Then place winglets on the decouplers as low as they can go. Don't use the winglets that are flat on the bottom. Use the ones that angle down. If you do it correctly, the tips of the winglet should be lower than your rocket engine. Next, add a decoupler to the bottom of your rocket. We now need to make two changes to the order of our stages. Move the three radial decouplers one stage up. Then move the rocket engine one stage down. This way, when you detach the rest of the rocket, your wings will not fall off and your engine will be already activated. Now we will add a tricoupler. To that, we stack three sets of fuel tanks and we will use vectoring engines on this stage. We will use a strut to tie our tanks together. This strut keeps our rocket from wobbling and is very helpful. Three more decouplers finish out this step. Now we will make another stack of three sets of fuel tanks, once again using the vectoring engines. This will be the inside of our first stage and will keep our rocket flying straight. Again, use a strut to hold it all together. Now we will make the outside of our first stage. Place a radial decoupler on the bottom of the second to last stage. You will need to place it as low as possible. Now add a solid rocket booster to the radial decoupler. Again, you will need to place it as low as possible. Place a tricoupler under the solid rocket. If you aren't able to place the tricoupler, you will need to lower the solid rocket or the radial decoupler. Now place three sets of nine fuel tanks. This time we will use the non-vectoring engines since it is more powerful and will give us the boost we need to leave the atmosphere. We will then need to tie the whole rocket together. We need to tie each of the three external stacks together, then tie each stack to the center stack. We will put a strut here and here, then as best as possible put a strut on the inside. Now tie the external stacks to the internal at two places. There is now one more issue we need to fix. The external stacks use their fuel more quickly than the internal stack. We need to discard the external stacks before the internal. We need to create a stage below stage 5, which is the second stage. Then move the radial decouplers to the new empty stage. Now it's time to test our rocket. We'll press T to turn our SAS on, push our engines to max, then take off. The rocket should take off easily and remain stable. A total of 15 rockets should be pushing on the first stage. Wait until the solid rockets burn out. Turn the engines off. Press the space bar to release the external rockets. Accelerate to make sure the center stack still works. Turn off the engines again and drop the center stack. Pressing the space will trigger the next stage. Make sure it works fine. 
Once again, turn off the throttle and release the next stage. The final rocket should already be activated, so all you need to do is accelerate. Pressing space one more time will cause the winglets to be tossed aside. Finally, turn off the rocket, jettison the final stage, and trigger the parachute. If there was a problem with your rocket, watch the video again and see what you missed. With your rocket now working, we can begin our long journey to the moon. Load up your new rocket and take off for the stars. When your ship hits a speed of 550 meters per second, turn the ship toward the horizon of 270 degrees. Careful, it can be a little unwieldy. Alternatively, you can travel toward 90 degrees and also make it to the moon. The real benefit of heading towards 270 degrees is that it takes less time, whereas a heading of 90 degrees uses less fuel. Thankfully, our rocket has more fuel than we need, so it makes sense to travel this way. When your external tanks run out of fuel, jettison them to save weight. Next, the inner stack. Continue burning toward the horizon until you reach 2,300 meters per second. You are now orbiting. Look behind you and locate the moon. When it begins to set behind the planet, you will need to do your transfer burn. Point the ship at 270 degrees and begin your burn. You will need to look at the orbital map to watch your progress. Be careful because it's easy to overshoot. I like to burn full power until I reach 6 million meters, then stop, correct my heading. Then I do a minimum burn until I reach 11.4 million meters. The closer I get to 11.4 million meters, the less lateral movement I have when I get to the moon. Now, if you chose to head toward 90 degrees instead of 270, wait until you see the moon rise, then do your burn exactly the same way. If you get your transfer orbit close enough, you will be on a collision course with the moon. If you're just a few hundred meters off, you will need to do a retro burn to deorbit. Your rocket has enough fuel for such a situation. As we approach the moon, we need to keep our direction opposite the way we are traveling. At all times, we need to keep our heading pointed toward the green X. Because we approach from 270 degrees, the combined speed of the moon and our orbit will be very fast. By the time we reach 50,000 meters from the surface of the moon, we will be traveling at nearly 1,000 meters per second. At that time, it will take less than 45 seconds before we are a crater on the moon. Instead, we need to do a safety burn, slow down to only a couple hundred meters per second. There's a little bit of a balancing act here. If we travel too fast, we may not have enough time to slow ourselves down. If we stay too slow, we can burn too much fuel and run out. I like to do two safety burns, one just before 50,000 meters and one just before 10,000 meters. When we reach 5,000 meters, we will need to begin our powered descent. Basically, we will fire a low burn to keep us from gaining too much speed. I like to keep the speed just below 200 meters per second until about 1,000 meters. Then I will keep this below 50 meters per second until 500 meters. We need to get ready to land. We need to get rid of any amount of lateral movement as it can cause us to fall over. If you have been keeping your rocket pointed toward the green X, it should have gotten rid of most of your lateral speed. We need to slow down below 15 meters per second. You will need to try and judge how far off the moon you are. The mountains of the moon can rise higher than 400 meters, so you may be closer than you think. Or, you may need to drop a few hundred more meters. Take a breath. It's time to land. First, turn off your engines. Then, immediately trigger the next stage. Turn up your engine so that you continue your slow descent. We want to make contact no faster than 4 meters per second. Use the SAS to lock your ship straight up and down. With your SAS still on, you can lean your ship to get rid of any other lateral movement. Now, patiently land your ship. Slowly descend until you make contact. 
If your ship begins to fall over, quickly accelerate to save yourself. You can try again. As long as you have half a tank of fuel left, you will be able to return home. In this clip, I land, but I start sliding down a hill. It's not a big deal because I'm not falling over. However, I notice that I'm sliding toward jettisoned ship parts. I abort the landing. A little later, I land safely. If you have trouble landing on the moon, try practicing landing on Kerbin first. It's harder because there's more gravity than on the moon, but you can try again more easily. Now that you are safely on the moon, take a moment to bask in the glory of your achievement. You truly are a Kerbal hero. But what good is it to be a hero? If you can't sign autographs, time to go home. Accelerate your rocket to maximum thrust. Turn toward 270 degrees and burn toward the horizon. We no longer need those winglets, so press space to get rid of them. We'll need to make it at about 800 meters per second for escape. Once you hit 800 meters per second, turn off your engine. We will need to save the fuel so that we can deorbit to Kerbin. Hopefully you will end up traveling opposite the direction of the moon. Otherwise, you will need to wait until you get farther away from it. The orbital map will soon show you an orbit around Kerbin. When you get to the apoapsis, do a retro burn. As you approach the planet, toss the rest of your rocket and trigger your parachute. You are now home. It took me a considerable amount of time and effort to perfect the moon landing, but I think this is the most efficient and safest route to the moon. Even then, it takes considerable skill to make a moon landing. You may not get it the first few tries, but keep trying, and before you know it, making moon landings will be a routine mission for you.